Hallo zusammen, ähm, ich bin Nicolas Carton von Efficient IP. Ähm, heute werde ich kein Deutsch sprechen, nur Englisch, ähm, because my German is like, like far, far away. So believe me, it's much better for you if I speak to English than German. Um, so unlike all of the other topics where basically you had all of the slides in English and the speaker in German, then here you will have the chance to have both in English. So, topic of today is uh, just waiting for this thing to switch. It's, it's basically uh, DNS and with more a focus on uh, the caching and the recursive DNS part. Um, thank you. Um, so basically, uh, what we're going to talk about today is a few facts about the cache and recursive servers then um, an example of an attack that we have uh, discovered, how it works, and how you could protect the DNS server. So, but before we switch into this specific presentation, uh, just a few reminders uh, uh, around DNS. Uh, so when you talk about DNS, uh, there are two main types of, of DNS services. Uh, the first one, which is the DNS authoritative server, meaning that you basically deal with zones that you are responsible for, say, uh, dnog.de. Um, and then you are um, being requested from other server, other clients. And when someone is asking uh, whatever .dnog.de, you will then answer to this question. So this is uh, an authoritative DNS server. Now, a cache and recursive server, uh, its goal is still to provide DNS, but it's more to DNS resolution. So if you're using the Wi-Fi today, then obviously you got a DHCP lease and part of the DHCP option which, which we have sent to you is a DNS server, which is acting both as a cache server, if it already knows the answer, and as a recursive server if it doesn't know and has to go to the internet. So with that said, uh, as I said, a few facts about cache and recursive server. So this is typically how DNS traffic looks like on a cache server at an ISP level. So we've got the green part, which is what we call the cache hit, meaning um, the answer was already in the cache, meaning we didn't have to go doing a recursion and find um, a, a domain name. So it has, of course, the advantage of being much faster in terms of answer for the, for the user. Then the blue part is the miss exist, meaning that uh, we already had the answer, but this was expired, so we had to go uh, and do the recursion again. And the red one is we didn't have the answer at all, so this is a miss not exist, so we have to go to the internet uh, to find the answer. So in terms of split, in terms of breakdown, uh, you basically have around 90%, could be slightly more or less depending uh, on, on the ISP and on the cache server, but a typical scenario is basically 90 to 95% cache hit, and the rest is just cache miss. So some numbers which are really interesting because when we uh, dove into uh, some customers' cache servers, we found these numbers interesting. So you have like two big diagrams. So the first on the left is basically uh, means that 2% of the resources of the um, request that you had, 2.1 to be precise, uh, resulted in 99% of your hits. Or the other way around, 99% of your hits were due to 2% of your request, which is kind of huge. Um, and if you are more precise, 0.11 of your queries, of the resource records that you've been queried, result in 93% of the hits, which is, again, huge. So most of the things that you are dealing with are really a few numbers of domains of resource records. And when you think about it, it <coughs> makes sense because most of the time, people tend to go to the same domain names. Uh, could be like either business domain names like Salesforce, or could be uh, more casual domain names like Facebook, uh, Google, Gmail, you name it, Twitter. All these types of domains basically are usually requested. So that's the first fact. The second fact is if you look at the TTL, meaning uh, the duration before a resource record expires from the cache and has to be requested again, using recursion, um, you have more than half of them which have like less than four minutes of TTL, which is low. And uh, if you take this duration 
and up to seven minutes, which is 420 seconds, that makes 83%, more than uh, three quarters of all of your uh, resource records. And basically, this also makes sense because most of the time, the, uh, the main names I um, exposed before, like Twitter, like um, Google, and these type of things, are mainly dealing with CDNs. Um, and CDNs, if you take the likes of Akamai or AWS, they need to use short ETL in order, in order to be able to provide uh, the best possible service. So, with some of these domains, again, uh, I just picked the most popular ones, I probably miss some of them, uh, but it means that if your DNS service, your DNS cache and recursive service is unavailable, it means that in a few seconds or a minute, you could, you could basically lose all of your DNS resolution. So for instance, if you take twitter.com, twitter.com has a 30 seconds TTL, meaning that if your recursive server is no longer available, your cache is still there, that's fine, but after 30 seconds, this twitter.com resource record is expired, then you have to do the recursion again, meaning after 30 seconds, your twitter.com is just dead. And it goes the same with the rest of this TTL. Uh, the Google Galaxy domains are basically five, mi five minutes TTL uh, records, YouTube, Gmail, all these records are basically f five minutes. And the longest one is around half an hour, it must be Facebook or Apple.com. So the point of today is more to highlight the fact that the recursive and cache servers are very important. Uh, it's like a car insurance. You know, when you don't have a car insurance, you just drive and you don't really pay attention until you have an accident. Uh, and it's pretty much the same when you deal with DNS and with DNS cache and recursive services. Uh, it's just something we, you know, which sits somewhere on your network and you don't really pay attention until it's broken. So that's the idea. Um, and the second point I want to make is that most of the DDoS attacks or things that you are thinking about when you, when you think about DDoS attacks are really um, something which is about uh, authoritative DNS servers and not much about cache and recursive servers. So here with this nice guy doing some workout, uh, workout only from, from one side, um, the point is to say that we, we have like both high and low volume attacks. So high volume attack is kind of easy to detect, meaning that you just monitor uh, the, your, your traffic, uh, the number of queries per second that you have, and it's kind of easy to, uh, to detect something and then to, to mitigate it. Um, now, in terms of DNS recursive servers, a high volume attack is not exactly what you would think about in terms of numbers of queries. Uh, when we talk about DDoS attacks, with millions of queries, it's against authoritative server or cache servers, meaning they can handle a lot of DNS queries per second. By design, a recursive DNS server has limitation. So uh, the 10K is already quite high. Uh, so you could have slightly more, but you will never have uh, a DNS recursive server which is able to do millions of queries per second. So meaning that in terms of attacks, it's very easy to set up an attack to, um, to bring down your DNS recursive server. And if you don't have DNS server again, you don't have any business. You are not able to, um, to provide DNS resolution anymore. So I talked about the high volume attacks. Um, the low volume attack also exists. And the idea here is that it's um, very complex to detect, therefore to mitigate. Uh, it can come from different and multiple sources. Uh, and as always, with dealing with attacks, you always have a risk to have all positive. So if you say, if a, cl uh, a client, a DNS client, is sending more than 100 of queries per second, then I will block it. And of course, you could have false positive as well. So just an example of attack, uh, which, which can happen. Uh, we, we named it slow attack. So the idea, is to basically bring down a DNS recursive server. Uh, and it's kind of easy to do. Uh, the idea is to exhaust its capacity, meaning you will send requests, uh, and you just want this server not to be able to answer anymore. And of course, 
because you are kind of smart, you will do it using different sources. You will not only use one specific client. You want to do it from different sources in order to have something which is as low as possible in terms of traffic. So the idea is to stay under the radar. So how you do it? Uh, it's very basic to do. Uh, you just need to set up an authoritative DNS server. Uh, could be a normal bind. Um, there is a typo here, uh, the max recursive client is not something you do on the authoritative, it's something you do on your recursive server. So if you have a recursive server which is set to allow 10,000 uh, concurrent recursive clients, uh, which is already quite high, uh, then you, you will have the following scenario. On our authoritative bind server, we just introduce uh, a, a dirty patch, which will just, when it receives a request, Instead of entering directly, it will just wait. Could be one, two seconds, depends, uh, until it delivers the answer. So the idea is not to say this will be in timeout because your re recursive server is normally smart enough to detect that a server is in timeout or has issue, and then it will kind of ignore it. The idea is to still answer, but answer very slowly, meaning that you will end up with a lot of things waiting on your recursive DNS server uh, and in the end have a lot of issues. And then all you need to do is launch some queries on the targeted recursive server, again using multiple DNS clients. And of course, if you do this and you have this, let's say, two seconds um, wait before answering on the authoritative server, you can very easily bring down the DNS server. And why does it stop resolving? Well, basically, it's because for each recursive query that you send, you have a UDP socket which is open. And of course, this number is not unlimited. So after a while, you have all of your sockets which are busy waiting to get an answer, and then you are screwed. So that's, again, just an example of uh, to explain to you uh, that the TNS recursive server uh, and cache actually also need your attention. So following slides are more um, I this uh, discussion, so then uh, I'll be open to, to question. Um, the global idea is that today, when you think about the tools that you have, uh, a lot needs to be done in terms of, uh, of tools. Um, when you deal, about, deal with TNS DDoS attacks, most of the time you think about volumetric attacks. And I as I showed you before, it's not really a volumetric atta attack, this, um, this closed DNS attack. So, a usual technique will not work because this is not a volumetric attack. So some things which could be done in terms of um, evolution, in terms of techniques, would be to get much more statistics per IP, right? Uh, for instance, the time spent on recursion, uh, because with such uh, indicators, you could have much more information in there, and then for uh, take the relevant decision. And of course, again, uh, there's no magic bullet, bullet. So for instance, if you take the time spent on the recursion, uh, you always have, you know, when you find a solution, you always need to, to think about, okay, will it cover all of the possible cases or not? And in that case, we found a very basic one, which is to say, okay, if I were to say, let's say a client is spending more than 200 milliseconds uh, for recursion, which is already kind of high, um, then, I will, uh, or when I say client, I mean uh, also the, the recursive server, then I should block it or do something. And if you try something basic, you just find um, something which is, sorry, something which is uh, quite far. So in that case, I took uh, an open recursive server in Vietnam, and you just try to resolve something, right? And if you do like a dig mit.edu at this IP, you end up with something which is quite high. So in that case, this is a legitimate query, but you would block or you would mitigate something which hasn't to be mitigated. So, in terms of solution, the idea is to say um, this recursive server is kind of a bottleneck if you, if you think about it. Um, so, and the problem is um, because you have this bottleneck, you always, you also have an impact on the cache function because if you lose, if you lose a recursive function, even if you have your cache which is there, you will end up with something which is not there any longer after a few seconds. So, in terms of possibilities, and again, I'm not saying that one is better than the other; it's just 
options that we have talked about. Uh, the first one is blocking, of course. You need to find the correct uh, indicators and be able to block with, of course, the same issue that you have when you deal with blocking, not only with DNS attacks, but any kind of blocking could be anti-spam, for instance, meaning the false positive. It's really tough to, uh, to mitigate uh, and be sure that what you're going to do is uh, going to catch everything and not have false positive. The second idea is to basically forbid recursion, which is, li which is linked to the third one, which is answer from the cache. The idea there is to say, okay, rather than not answering at all uh, for a client, like blocking, uh, we could kind of try to do something, meaning we know that something is happening. Uh, could be like a random query name attack, like uh, Ralph was explaining before, uh, but we know that something is blocking, so is, is arriving. So uh, we will stop answering for stuff which are not already in the cache for this specific client, uh, and we will only answer from the cache, meaning that if you take the example of a CPE, let's say you have a remote office with possibly 500 clients behind the CPE, uh, what you see uh, as, a, uh, as a DNS server is a single IP. You only see the IP of the CPE. So if you have something which is triggering your uh, mitigation system, uh, if you block it, then you will not only block one user, you will block 500 of them. So the idea is to say, uh, we, we can have something in between, which is to say, we have detected something nasty. We're not gonna block everything. We're just gonna answer only from the cache. It's not perfect, uh, but at least we have something which allows us to keep answering to the 499 other uh, clients, DNS clients, which are in the end human beings sitting under the computer. Uh, and they will still be able to go to google.com, Facebook, uh, Salesforce, and so on. The idea there is to be that, uh, in that case, when I say answer from the cache, uh, we uh, kind of manipulate the cache to have something which allows us not to expire the records. Again, that's, that's more an idea. So in conclusion, um, really the goal of this talk was uh, more to explain uh, that we need to think, of you need, and we need to think about uh, the recursive and cached DNS servers. Um, why is that? Because, again, most of the time when you think about mitigation techniques, they are really, um, can be applied to authoritative servers. And it's, there's very little done for the cache and recursive server, basically because it's much more complex to handle. You have much more resource records to handle. Uh, most of the time when you deal with a basic authoritative server, it's possibly hundreds of, or thousands of zones and maybe 10,000 of records, which is not much. Uh, whereas if you deal with uh, any cache recursive server, it's in the, in the scale of the millions. So of course, it's not the same story in terms of mitigation. So as I said, uh, these different techniques block, forbid, recursion, and answer from the cache could be an idea. Uh, and also, just to mention that IC has uh, released like one month ago, uh, it's a feature which was already there in, uh, let's say, in testing mode for a while, but now it's officially there. Uh, they, they, they call it uh, fetches per server and fetches per zone. Uh, the idea is uh, exactly to say, um, well, if we detect something, uh, specific clients or uh, one or several clients which are trying to do something which is not normal, uh, then we will block these clients. Uh, so for instance, the fetches per server could be um, useful if you, if you find that a lot of clients are flooding a specific DNS server. And the fetches per zone is something which could be useful uh, if you are dealing with random query name attacks. Um, it's, as, I, as I wrote here, it's still disabled by default because, of course, if you block, you always have a risk of collateral damages. Uh, so it's something that you, if you, if you plan to implement it, you need to, uh, of course, to test uh, and to be sure that if something happens, you are ready to, to take action. This is it. Hagen? In English, possibly. <laughs> Irgendwelche Fragen für Nicolas? Ja, yeah, I think Ralf has a question. <laughs> so on answering on out of the cache, the problem that you described earlier that uh, the 
one or two percent of the stuff that everybody asks actually changes quite frequently. Yeah. And uh, if you answer out of the cache, your answer will be stale very soon if you just don't fetch, fetch a new record. I mean, uh, people like Netflix uh, just randomly kill their servers because they, that's the way how they operate. So, uh, I mean, answering out of cache, I, I don't think, is a long-term solution. We need to work on the recursion there. And we find the stuff you described there are, I think, with that at least, this is the outbound rate limiting at least late, late to the party, but that's what we have to do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course, uh, as I say, uh, answering from the cache is not the perfect solution because we kind of break DNS and RFCs because we do not make the record expire. Uh, but it's, it's true that for CDN it may be challenging, especially for Netflix, but at least it's better than nothing at all. That's the idea. Thank you. Danke, Nicolas. <laughs>